Uh, the incubator, the oxygen, and the oxygen and the oxygen conditions, and over time, about four, five, six weeks, you will follow how much phosphate comes out of it, and you calculate this in a flux. And this is what we usually do, we express our loading as a flux. And uh, you can see that in this sediment, uh, it contains a lot of phosphorus, it's a typical Dutch black sediment, and it goes really up, sky high. Adding a simple bentonite, well, it doesn't do much, or it reduces a bit, but that's because of the layer on top of it, it's a matter of time, and this is also divided. The phosphor and the modified zeolite, they reduce the uh, phosphate influx tremendously. That's nice, that's good to see. This is not a compound, but it's much more difficult to get. So we are thinking of making it now ourselves. Uh, this one is well tested, uh, uh, many applications throughout the world. This one has not been tested so well, and only a few applications in New Zealand. It's made in New Zealand, so this is not an issue. If you need to buy it, you need to transfer it over the half of the plant. And uh, it's not so friendly and also extremely costly. And so far, uh, it's not that commercialized, but it's a possibility. Thinking about other compounds, we know from zeolite, uh, really amorphous, and uh, you can modify them easily, and they can also trap ammonia. We'll come back to that later. The phosphor has been uh, used in many sites already over the over the planet. This is from a paper that appeared in 2013. Uh, we learned to read, all, to read all, the, all the legs, and this is only a minor fraction of the legs, which is a decent to document it properly. And uh, you can see that the dosing uh, varies between 0.06 tons per hectare up to about uh, 6.7 uh, tons per hectare. So a variety of dosing, and this is uh, due to the fact that you dose based on the amount of bioavailable phosphorus in your system. This means how much phosphate is in the water column and how much can come out of the sediment. So it really depends on how much is in there. So you cannot copy paste yeah, a dosing from one system to another. You need to do this diagnosis. You need to know how much can be released if, and also to get an idea if internal loading is the main issue. Because if it's not, then you're not going to use these kind of products, of course, unless you want to spend money, but then there are other ways to go to the casino to get um, there will be a paper coming out from Danish colleagues, Nina Dittman and, and some other European uh, scientists, in which we uh, analyzed the lanthanum in the sediment using some uh, uh, fancy uh, techniques. And we found that indeed the lanthanum in the sediment of treated lakes is in the form of uh, rapid phenomenology. This was a big question to us. Is it really powered to phosphate or is it maybe salt to humic acid? I thought that in the last that there would be far salt to humic acid. Well, they proved me wrong, so that's, I'm grateful for that. So we have really a proof of the mechanism in the field. This is important. And last but not least, lanthanum is being used as a medication, as phosphorinol for people that suffer from hyperphosphatemia, those that suffer from kidney failure. So there's a huge medical literature on it, and this is very convenient when it comes down to uh, all kinds of toxicity issues and questions that every water manager should ask when you are coming along with this to test. So this is, this is, this is convenient to us, and uh, we can make use of all this information that it's safe for state binder. So if we sum up the results of our years of small scale testing, we found strong phosphate removal from water and also anoxia, a strong reduction from uh, sediment release, we didn't find any effects on, uh, on pH, etc. And also, at least, we didn't find any toxicity issues. So, this was for us reason enough to do upscale to ecosystem that. And I will give you three examples of experiments in a little bit larger scale. Uh, one is in compartments, in, in open water, one is in a small-sized lake, an official bathing site, and the other one is in another lake. The first compartment. So we made some uh, 20 by 20 meter compartments, and in one compartment we did nothing, in the other one we removed the fish and we threw in some uh, submerged macrophytes. This one we added a little bit of puck and some phospholog. This one we only added phospholog. We did some dredging and park and dredging alone and it also in all these uh, fish stock was manipulated and plants were introduced. 
The reason why we reduced fish stock is that our analysis showed that we had 1,500 kilograms of fish, the majority carp and gibble carp. These would and go to the seven. If you want to have clear water with this amount of fish, forget about it, it will never work. So it already is an example that your system tells you what you need to do to get to your desired outcome. You can see already that often some time, the ones that received uh, uh, some additional sediment treatment, that their plants leave out, and actually fill up the entire water down, and the water became clear. This one remained turbid. Our analysis of the system also uh, gave us some uh, ideas about where, what loadings, more or less, uh, agree with these changes. Huh? So 3.1, and of course, it's a modeling exercise, though so this comes with uncertainty of about 100%, but it gives at least an idea about the order of magnitude. So you know that you need to go to uh, 4, 5, 2, between uh, these kind of, uh, in which you will be able to go to a clear water state with submerged water plants. We use this kind of uh, modeling always to get an idea of where we are, and also how far we need to go back. Uh, in this system, we did some more analysis. Uh, we measured the runoff several times, also storm events, and this one already came to 4.7 milligram per meter per day. Groundwater we neglected because this lake was made in the 90s and sealed with clay, it should be impermeable. Uh, we captured the deficit of the water, and our biggest surprise, our measurements of the water, that is the main water source which is feeding this uh, this lake is a separate sewer system, so it should contain only rainwater and stuff collected from the surface. It turned out to be a main source of nutrients and of phosphorus, also among the other phosphorus. These are huge amounts. So in total, external load is 22 milligrams per liter. So this is far more than the three or two for we need to be able to get a system with some uh, kicking back to a clear water state and of course with a lot of uh, carbs in it as well. The internal load was about 1.7 milligrams. So this is much less than external. I will, uh, I will skip this because these are water frame directives. Uh. If we look at the, uh, the compartments and at the phosphate release from the treatments, something surprising going on. The dredging, uh, did not reduce the, um, the phosphate uh, deflux. And the reason for that is that this water in the entire neighborhood was made of former agricultural soil. So we just opened the next layer of soil to start to release nutrients. So in this one, the fossil and the park, they show much lower than that. The initial uh, uh, change by removing the first layer, it helped, uh, it helped, it made the water clear, it helped for the plants to be established. Over time, these ones, if we would have been allowed to keep on this uh, experiment for longer than two years, but we were not, then uh, uh, these uh, two treatments would also have turned into uh, green turbid water again. Um, now we go to two whole lake experiments, Lake Houdlake and uh, Lake Gau. Both were suffering from cyanobacterial blooms, and these blooms were intensified. So in Lake Houdlake in 2007, there was a four month swimming ban, and uh, there, were, there, was a, there were things to sell there, and uh, people had to pay an entrance fee, and there were also people there to maintain the property and you have to be lifeguards so that, and it's owned by the municipality so the costs uh, for loss of income and for people that still need to, need to be paid salary was 150,000 euros yeah, in, uh, in this year for this small parking site and on uh, warm days you can easily receive two, three, four thousand dollars and they each had to pay about two and a half euros so that makes them that it's when it's good weather and the water quality is nice, it's a nice place to be. But this resulted in a lot of income. Our system analysis, and again we have the peak fluxes here, indicated that most of the phosphate in these waters was from the sediment. 
Uh, this one, are rather isolated. There's no streams coming in, only groundwater and precipitation. And over the years, nutrients have accumulated there. In Lake Rauwraken, the major source here is leaf litter, so leaves have come in and groundwater. Leaves are around 2.5 kilograms phosphorus per year, groundwater around 2.1. Uh, and that accumulates over time and then gives a huge pool in the sediment. So here, uh, we uh, were aiming for tackling the phosphate release from the sediment. That was not the entire thing that has been done. Before that, already the banks have been restored, the vegetation was removed, tried to reduce the external loading. Some fish were removed. This is a nice carp which was in there. It's not a Dutch record, it's almost, but it's not. Uh, and these guys, in the 80s, of course, the authorities uh, wanted to get rid of the uh, submerged plants, so they dumped in hundreds of, uh, or 500 of grass carps. Uh, do you know grass carps? Yeah. Oh, oh also, yeah, okay. So, um, we noticed that they can eat 150% of their body weight per day during summer. Ah, and these guys were 9, 10 kilograms each. So we just went to the supermarket and weighed the crops of lettuce. This came down to 62 crops of lettuce they were eating per day. So we have now an idea how much macrophytes they can consume. And by doing so, how much nutrients they can bring in the water. Um, when these guys were there, well, you can already see, they eat virtually everything. There are some few uh, invertebrate ones left. But the, the lake was a desert under water. Not a single submerged plant was there. So, also these needed uh, to be removed, which was a challenge. We almost succeeded, there are three left. Three, no, for sure. Right. Um, the blooms unfortunately remained. And this was done in 2000, yeah, uh, but the blooms remained next to the game even worse. Uh, Luckily, we didn't meet the person who said we should uh, bring the cross path back because she intended to intensify the blooms. Uh, the blooms are uh, uh, increased. And we were confronted with a bloom and a scout just before we wanted to do an application in 2008. So, um, we brought in two tons of phosphor on top of the water. Mix it in and mix also the scum. Uh, you have clay particles in the water and the next day you make frogs. So we make flocks with clay and algae, and these flocks go down rapidly. So the next day, you could really see the bottom. Right, you could clearly see 10 meters deep. You see the small. Right. And then we decided to do the capping and dumped in a little bit more phosphor to do sediment capping. Dosage was based on uh, uh, analysis of how much phosphate was in the water in the sediment was available. These are the results of total phosphorus over time, the years before, some seasonality in there, and after application, and it continues until the present one here. So, in reducing total phosphorus, this, this treatment was a success, because it is a big success. If we look at the internal loading, before it was about 15 uh, uh, milligrams phosphorus per day, and after we reduced. And it has a tendency to increase over time, eh? this 2011, 2013, because the start of 2015 is about here, it's about the same level. So it intends to increase, and which is logic, because we have an ongoing uh, external <coughs> loading from leaf litter and from, also from groundwater. This means that this intervention will not have eternal life. Uh, we estimated 10, 15 years with the help of macrophytes. Uh, probably it will be uh, 8 to 10 years looking at uh, how the progress has been done. Next intervention, if authorities want to do it, will be much less intense than the first one. That's called maintenance. As a scientist, I was very honest with them. Uh, I would prefer that to do nothing. Because for me, it's the most interesting to see how long and if it goes back. But I cannot decide, of course. And it's very selfish because it's a bottling site still. Um, this lake, if we plot the mean sunlight chlorophyll A concentration, biomass for algae, and mean sunlight total phosphorus concentration, we moved it from eutrophic to mesotrophic state. And this is now also 2015 is in there, so this is now for 8 years. 
We're only after it. So the change for eight years already, that's nice. And of course, we've got more, much more plant on. Um, to summarize this, we've got high water transparency and much more plants, much lower for space in the water color. We had a second case. And again, before ap application, we had this uh, nozzle thing on the water and in the water, turned out to be aphanosominal. Here, we got no permits to use polyaluminium chloride as a flocculant. The authorities didn't want us to use it because they were afraid of aluminium. No matter what we tried, all the documents we supplied, uh, it turned out we were fighting against sent sentiments and arguments do not work against sentiments. So, unfortunately. This brought us another problem because we were forced to use iron chloride, which we know it works less. And then we had problems with the guys who needed to do the application because they did not want to use this corrosive iron chloride in between. So we had to flock before. And this is not a recommended sequence. If you remember from the other one, it's better to have first a ballast in it and then the flock that you have the ballast inside your flocks. Now we needed to get ballast attached to flocks that have already formed. And a, we were lucky that there was not a big wind because if you make these flocks, as you remember from the, the tubes, they go up. Uh, and you can imagine if, if these would have been run to the shallow bathing area, and we would have been, it would have had a big problem. So this is not the preferred sequence, we were lucky. So we brought them down. And this was a novelty in this uh, project to do a deep injection there where needed. This was a former sand excavation, so the lake had not this nice U shape. It was a moon uh, landscape, craters, hills, crater hills. Uh, so we decided to dump in. And using the sonar there where it's needed in the hot spots. The sediment accumulates in the deepest spots, so that's what we did there. Here you see the iron uh, chloride application, and this is the surface uh, uh, addition of uh, the, the ballast. Also, for this lake, we uh, were able to move it from a eutrophic to a mesotrophic state, and it, it's in there now for seven years. Looking at the zooplankton in this lake, this last one, well, this is the moment of application here. And this is before, this is during, or we see rotters coming up. We see you know, different diaphanosomena coming up. We see our daphnias in there. So, this lake is still alive. Don't worry, it's still alive. When we look at the vegetation cover, well, the pre vegetation data are non existing. Because the authorities didn't consider it worth to measure because it was virtually absent. So there will be a tiny bomber there. This is the first year after application. You see an increase in, uh, in the vegetation cover. Of course, these are species that represent eutrophic uh, sediments. But we were happy, we happy to see this. More vegetation, more plants. The advantage of having more plants is that you have more structure in your water. So it has also had a positive impact on the microfauna. Still need to publish it. Then about fish. We have a fish uh, stock uh, measurement before application, different species, completely different uh, from the ones you have here. So that's why I put some uh, pictures in it. Um, after application, we found much higher densities of carbs. We were happy to see higher densities of pikes. Uh, these are fishery hunting predators, stock predators, so it's nice. Uh, this is a grass carp. We were also surprised to see grass carp this side. And we were surprised to see carps this big size. So I we just had a chat with the fishing uh, community there. And they said, well, right, the lake is much more attractive now to us. So we have decided to stock them with carps. And uh, okay, so that's a side effect of it. Uh, we, made, we made the lake much more appealing. Um, I'm a bit worried, of course, for, uh, for this because these. Um, these fish, they also need food. And these uh, fishermen feed them, which is good because otherwise I'm not sure if there would be enough food for them. But because this was already under more eutrophic conditions, it's 50 kilograms an hectare, you go to almost three times. So, anyway, anyway uh, the lake was more appealing to fishermen. Of course, uh, it's an experiment, huh? and we want to know everything about what we introduced there, especially the lanthanum. We found lanthanum 
this is uh, uh, Latin concentrations in different tissues, liver, bone, muscle, skin, or fish. In black, it's before fish that we call before the application, and white and grey after. So, in most of them, you see that lanthanum concentrations are higher. This means that lanthanum goes into the fish. The company claims it's not bioavailable. Well, it is. It is going into the fish. That's for sure. That's what our measurements show. Not high concentrations, and there are no signs of any toxicity there. And it's also about the form in which it's in, uh, in, the, in the organisms. The same we had with uh, crayfish. There are many crayfish in the lake, so we decided to do some experiments with crayfish because crayfish go over the sediment. And also in this experiment, we found an increase also after the generation of lanthanum in different tissues of the crayfish. But in all the experiments we did, we could not find any sign of toxicity. So we do see some elevation, which is logical if you consider that background concentration also elevated, but no toxicity uh, in the soil. So to summarize these results of all leg experiments, we moved both legs from a eutrophic to mesotrophic state. And the costs of application were 50,000 euros and 140,000 euros. So 50,000 euros is virtually nothing compared to 150,000 euros loss of income in 2007. And if it's in there for eight years, that's about 7,000 euros per year. These are normal maintenance costs. Huh? This is an official bargaining site. Uh, the authorities maintain the grass, they maintain the beach, you know, do all kinds of things there. So 7,000 euros per annum, to, that's to be easily to be covered in the maintenance. But this is something worldwide people don't do. Also in the Netherlands. If we have a bottling site, we do everything. Yeah, to, we maintain our parks, we maintain everything, we do not maintain the water. We, we point out a certain uh, uh, function to it, but then forget about that it might also be wise to do something. Is there. Also for the swimming pool part. But it, it's very easy in this lake to let the water out at the end of the swimming season because it has a separated small pool and remove all the, the, the leaves that are formed in. It's also, it will be much more appreciated with partners as well. Simple things that can be done that um, could easily be covered. To we call these kind actually of, uh, of intervention called geoengineering in, uh, in water. So we do deliberate manipulations of biogeochemical cycles to evoke the desired outcome. I know this is a very uh, loaded word, uh, often people think that we want to dump tons of iron in the ocean. No, we're not. We only use these things when we think it might be useful. Both lakes are definitely better than before, and also, so far, after all these years, we haven't found any toxicity. This is also important to, to mention. And we didn't expect it, actually. Our experiment also touched upon a North American discussion. I want to mention this for those who have heard about it, because uh, there's a discussion about whether you should reduce only phosphorus or both nitrogen and phosphorus to control to control blooms. Um, the American Environmental uh, Protection Agency they launched a document last February stating that controlling only phosphorus may not effectively prevent harmful algal blooms in fresh waters. And their claim statement is based on enrichment experiments, like some scientists in the United States that do enrichment experiments. No, so it's logic that you need to have all building blocks to have a bloom. Yeah, you need nitrogen, you need carbon, you need iron, you need phosphorus, you need to be abundant to have the biomass. But justification is not the same as mitigation. They are completely wrong there. And they also neglect the in-lake situation. These two examples, these are phosphate-only control experiments. We didn't do anything about nitrogen. So this claim could all easily have been controlling only the main the effect. Huh? This is not based on all lake experiments. This is based on LMI experiments. And we know already since 75 that it's not important that which 
element is limiting now, but phosphate is the one that can be easily made limiting out of growth. This was Van Goldman, 1975 already. The retro ratio, which is the general composition of phytoplankton, yeah, of course, phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon is one to six, one to six. This means that phosphorus limitation is also stoichiometrically the most efficient one. We have uh, Liebig's law of the minimum. Better, actually, to call it Carl Sprengel's law of the minimum because he was 27 years earlier. You only need to limit one factor to control growth and phosphate is by far the easiest. We can do this. We can easily do this as we have seen here in these experiments. The uh, dual NP Africans refer often to Liebig's barrel. This is uh, published first by Hans von Arnold von Dobrek in nineteen three. It says that if you uh, have already quite some phosphate in your system and you add more phosphorus, there will be no more growth. If you add some more nitrogen, you will have more growth. And if you add both, you will up the barrel, you have the most growth. That's eutrophication, that's enrichment. If you want to control this, you only need to take out one to empty the barrel, not two, not three. In theory, this can be anything, but there's no reason to reduce both. And now we reach the, 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 the risk that because nitrogen reduction is much more difficult because of atmospheric deposition, because of all diffuse loads, and because of the, the, the nature of nitrates, for example, that authorities will say, oh wait, it's far too difficult, far too expensive, we are going to do nothing. Whereas we could do something, which is simply reduce phosphorus. That would also be a no regret measure to do. And of course, in theory, it doesn't matter which element you uh, reduce to the iron or whatever. Um, what in this discussion is completely lacking is that there might be good reasons to reduce the nitrogen load. Uh, we know that there might be toxicity with a really high concentration of ammonia in the water. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Definitely, it gets more sick when there's much more nitrate. And plants have a problem that nitrogen loading is very high. So there are reasons. But these are also not mentioned in the entire discussion. All this all goes for channel material blooms. When it comes down to controlling channel material blooms, then phosphorus control is sufficient, by far sufficient. Um, of course, we are also interested in reducing nitrogen. Huh? This is a scientific challenge. Um, we know that we have products, like zeolites, that can absorb ammonia. So if we look and our compounds tested before, the phosphor and the aqua P and the control, this ammonium release, this modified zeolite reduces ammonium release from the sediment tremendously. Not the phosphor. Well, this is the overestimation, this is some release from the, from the clay itself. So you can do something about the ammonium release from the sediment in case you need it. Of course, we need much more research for that. The possibility is there. So, a dual control of ammonia and phosphate is possible. We need to research more, and we are doing that already. And uh, in January, we will also uh, explore the possibilities in, uh, in this highly eutrophic reservoir in Brazil, in, uh, in Jacare Paguá. So, to summarize it, it all, mitigation should always start with the system analysis. No? So, you need to know all your inflow and contribution of different sources of nutrients. You need to know how your system is biologically, what is biologically make, biological makeup. And altogether, it will guide you to what might be done. And the fourth thing, most people don't want to hear, but that's doing nothing. Doing nothing is always an option. It depends on the cost, it depends on the feasibility. No. It's a, it is the worst. That's why it's, mm, you know, it's the worst one. The next one are curative measures. Curative measures means that you do not need to wait for all kind of expensive sanitation plants to be built, uh, all kind of uh, fancy novel agricultural activities. You can do something about blooms. This is fighting the symptoms. Uh, reality nowadays is such that we need to consider that. 
we have waited too long to prevent them. So the, the, the blooms are there and they are aggravating every year. And climate change is helping them a lot. So curative measures become more and more important. Algae sites are heavily promoted. I am not happy with algae sites at all. Because they will, well, they are very effective. Uh, don't get me wrong, they're very effective in killing. But you release uh, uh, toxins in the water. And if it's, and most of the times, the blooms are a problem, then it is a problem to us. It's a problem to the function here assigned to the water, either drinking water, irrigation water, recreational water, and then you don't actually want to have high concentration of dissolved toxins in the water. There might be alternatives, that will be after lunch. And of course, preventive measures or combined measures, these are probably the most uh, uh, promising ones, and they will combine, need to be combined external, and often also internal ones. But it depends huh, on your system analysis. Because if you're lucky and your eutrophication is not uh, uh, going on for that long, this one will be of minor importance. So then it's rather easy yeah, to, to solve a problem. It's much more expensive to tackle a problem if you have screwed up your system for many years. So that's my message to you. Right? I think what I'm not sure about the internal loading in the software. But I think external loading is a major driver here. And uh, the reason why we want to combine measures and do all kinds of inlake measures after external load reduction is that it will take many, many, many years in my part of the world before these interventions will become effective because of this huge pool which is in the sediment for what washed out disappeared. And we have to be aware of the fact that climate change may counteract this as well. So we know that more oligotrophic waters are much more resilient against all kinds of effects of climate change. But there's a pulse influx of nutrients, higher temperatures. Huh? If you don't have a high biomass of cyanobacteria, and not have the nutrients, you will ne you can cook it to, to, to 100 degrees, you will never get a, a cyanobacteria bloom. <coughs> so it's important to, to, to realize that. And these things become really important if we take also climate change into consideration. And that's why we are putting a lot of research effort nowadays in this, because uh, uh, we have uh, forced in my country too long that once we stop the external load, it would be solved. It's not. Uh, that would help nature a bit by removing fish. Well, it's not. We need to combine measures. Uh, and this is what your system analysis will help you to do. Uh, it will not be one measure. You will get a set of measures. And that will be the most promising set for your system. We are in 1972 clearly stated every lake is unique. Yeah. So we should treat every lake as a new patient. And hopefully we'll, get to that. we'll be able to, 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 to revert the current uh, <laughs> the current transaction of ongoing and growing cyanide material blooms worldwide. I think we can do so, but it needs a lot of effort from all of us. Not just from scientists, but definitely from uh, 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 what authorities and politicians as well. Then we can do it, then we can stop it. At least do something about this number one water quality issue worldwide. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was not too fast, Patricia, I'm sorry for that. If you, if you want to read more, there is a special issue in what research about to appear, several, journal, several manuscripts on this subject are already available free online. It should be open access, the entire issue should be open access if you want to write them. So these are a few that are already there. So you have, you have an idea about what is going on already in the scientific community from different angles, trying to, to, to help our systems to be brought into another we consider a better state. All kinds of people contributed. Thanks a lot. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Or your are
primero muchas gracias a... piensa eh, eh, que la autoridad de su país eh, la autorizaría ese trabajo si el, los lados, la fuente fuera 